In the beginning, our Father in six days created the heavens and the earth, and all of the host of them were finished. On the seventh day, He ended His work and rested. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, forever to be known as the Sabbath. He tells us to remember it and keep it holy. He tells us it's a perpetual sign between Him and His children forever throughout all their generations. Now I must ask a few questions. What did he mean by remember? Was anyone keeping the Sabbath before Moses and the law? Did the weekly Sabbath start Friday evening or Saturday morning? Did keeping the biblical Sabbath die with our Messiah on his cross? When and why did the Sabbath change from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week? Or did it? Why do people use the titles, the Christian Sabbath or the Lord's Day? Has forever come and gone, or does the biblical Sabbath still stand? I want to know. I would like to welcome each and every one of you to this week's episode of the Doctrine of Christ and as always, Brother Jimmy and I are so honored to do so because whether you know it or not, the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And once again, Brother Jimmy, just great honor to be able to study the doctrine of Christ and especially here with the Ten Commandments, I'm liking this. I am too. I am too. I've had a great week of studying for this especially. And let me, I I know that you've spent hours studying. I've spent hours studying. And to try to fit all that into one hour of teaching can be a challenge. So, you know, I'm just going to encourage everybody. You got to do some more digging. You could type in, go to any search engine and type in the Sabbath and all these things. You, You come up with all kinds of stuff that you can do your own research. But I know, David, that you found some good stuff. And I know that I have too. So we got a lot of good stuff. And (laughs) This is something we've taught on once or twice already in the DLC, and we you can't emphasize it enough. It's season very, one, season one, and, yeah. Um, uh, I, we've got a lot of material we're going to look at tonight. A lot of great reference material and information. So let's get to work. All right, Exodus chapter twenty, verse eight and nine. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work and do all thy work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it. Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. I want to begin by reading something from Alfred Edisham in his Bible history of the Old Testament, and he said this. He said, the introduction of the Sabbath command by the word remember, Exodus 28, conveys the impression of previous Sabbath observance on the part of Israel. And this is something we need to remember, that when the Sabbath was instituted in the Torah under Moses, that it had already been in existence. And we're going to be looking at the Sabbath before Moses, and this will help us understand what the Torah says. And in Genesis chapter 2, we go back to the origin of the Sabbath, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day. That seventh day is blessed. And I want to get in on that blessing and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And this is the Sabbath. This is the beginning of it. And we're going to talk about overthinking things. We're going to talk about getting away from the simplicity of Christ. And always when people come in with elaborate 
calendar schemes and all kinds of chicanery about the Sabbath. Just run for your life. The Sabbath is simple, pure, beautiful. This was the Sabbath. Work six, rest one. And the Sabbath before Moses. Let's look at this in uh, Exodus chapter 16. And this is very revealing. And in Exodus 16, the Ten Commandments had not been given yet. And we'll see here how the Sabbath operated uh, before the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 16, verse 16. And this is in the episode of the manna. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating an omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And down in verse 19, and Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, and some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. Now, there's a deep truth here. (laughs) There's a deep truth here that a lot of people struggle with, but the day begins in the morning. Gather on that that sixth day twice as much, but in the morning, that next day begins, you know, and if you gather it, you leave it till the morning of the next day through the week, you're going to have worms. Now, this really is something everyone should get, but a lot of people don't get it because of the rabbinic confusion that they want to sow into this issue. Well, not only that, the, the Roman calendar that we go by now, you know, the day starts at midnight for some reason. (laughs) Yeah. And there were um, early Methodists that did the midnight to midnight Sabbath. Hmm. And uh, but uh, and in reading on here in verse 21, and they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them that this is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. And you see, this shows that the Sabbath was being observed before the Ten Commandments. The Israel of God had observed the commandments since the institution of it back on the seventh day. Hmm. So, you know, the Sabbath is older than Moses, Yeah, says the rest of the Sabbath unto the Lord, bake that which ye will bake today, and see that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And the morning began the next day. You know, this is so simple and so clear that shame on us if we don't get it. And always the error is in the complexity. And The truth is in the simple, straightforward statements of Scripture. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So, a lot of good truths there. Yep. And the very simple truth and the very plain one is that in the Bible, the day begins at sunup. You know, and I've always uh, I said I'll use the illustration. If you had 10 first graders and you ask them all, does the day begin when the sun comes up or when the sun goes down? You'd get 10 out of 10. Well, of course, when the sun comes up, you bring in 10 rabbis. 10 out of 10, no, oh, it begins when the sun goes down. There's nothing, nothing, nothing in the Bible that talks about the day beginning at sundown. And we're going to look at that in detail before we're done. But the simplicity of Christ and any anything, uh, we're going to talk about the opposition of the Pharisees against Christ on the Sabbath issue. This is when, in Mark 3, they first decided to kill him. And Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, which means he's God. 
and he shows us the true way the Sabbath is to be observed. He didn't abolish it, but he showed the true meaning, and he differed with the oral Torah that the rabbis were trying to attach to the Sabbath. Yeah, he being the Word, and the Word was with God from the beginning and created all things. I'm sure he knows when the Sabbath is and, and how it's supposed to be how it's supposed to be kept. <laughs> yeah, and Christ is our example. And let's just look. I mean, this isn't hard. Matthew 28 and 1. And this isn't something that, well, it might be this and it might be that. No, it's this. It's this. Matthew 28 and 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn. Now, there you go. That's all you need to know. On Sunday, when it began to dawn, that was the end of the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath ends at sunrise Sunday. It begins at sunrise Saturday. That's the biblical Sabbath. That yeah. was the Sabbath in Exodus 16. That has always been the Sabbath of the Israel of God. And it's always been the Pharisees that have contended with the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, if you want to follow Christ, it's easy to know what he did. And all you need is this one verse, and there's not just one, there's many. But the biblical Sabbath that was observed by Christ ended daylight Sunday morning. This is the Sabbath that his followers followed, and we're going to see this in more issues and it, in more scriptures. But it's not like, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. No, it's this. No, it says it, it in— so it simple, says, A child can understand it. Yeah, it says that in Mark. It says it in Luke. It says it in John. And I mean, it talks about the day beginning, you know, in the morning before the, you know, as the sunrise is coming up. Yeah. And for those of you that are, your blood pressure's rising, we're going to get back to Genesis 1. But, you know, and I, I give grace to people. And, you know, if someone is trying to observe the Sabbath, I don't believe in the Sunday Sabbath. I don't believe in the Friday night Sabbath. I believe in the biblical Sabbath. You know, and if people are trying to obey God, I like to give them grace. But there's, at the same time, the leaven of the Pharisees will defile you. Leaven is something that once you get a little bit of it in you, it will grow and fester. Yeah. We need to get every bit of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees out of our life. Follow the word of God and the word of God only. Because whenever we ingest leaven, it's an open door for more of that stuff to attach itself to us. And it, that's just the way it is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The truth is always in the simplicity. The Bible, Matthew 28 and 1, the biblical New Testament Sabbath Christ observed, ended at sunup. Oh, but this calendar, you know, we got to get this calendar, that calendar, and we're going to talk about that just a little bit in a moment. But, you know, it, no, the error is in people that want to make, the, make it complex and hard. The truth is simple in Christ. And in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, and verse 21, the Bible says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. We follow in the steps of Christ. We don't follow in the steps of those that killed him. We contend with the Talmudizing of the Sabbath by Judaism, just as Christ did. So, Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I have a uh, read something here from the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1901. This is a huge set of the uh, put out by the Jews. You know, this is the Jewish publication, the Jewish Encyclopedia. Right. It is the most comprehensive, authoritative piece of work they've ever put out. Uh, 1905, it was published by. Funk and Wagnalls, you know, look this up in your Funk and Wagnall. Well, we will. And this is just an example of how these people just have a capacity to miss the whole thing. And this is what they say uh, on the lunar origin of the Sabbath. 
Now, we just read the origin of the Sabbath. God said, work six, rest one. This is what they say. Yeah, but that's in the same Torah that they have, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, now, they now are getting in on new manuscripts. There's now a a Jewish manuscript that's put out. Of course. uh, that, of course, yeah, so the Jews have gone away from the Masoretic text. Of course, the people of the Hebrew root movement have gone away from the Masoretic text. Of, of course. course. Yeah, let's get back to our Hebrew roots. Well, we'll have a Bible. We'll translate it. We'll throw out the Masoretic text. We'll translate it from a German text. That's literally what they do. Now, here's what they say in the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Sabbath, depending in Israel's nomadic period upon the observation of the phases of the moon. It could not, according to this view, be a fixed day. When the Israelites settled in the land and became farmers, their new life would have made it desirable that the Sabbath should come at regular intervals, and the desired change would have been made all the more easily as they had abandoned the lunar religion. So what they're saying now in the early days, they did it. It wasn't a fixed day. It would be according to the moon, the lunar Sabbath and these lunar calendars that a lot of people want to push today. That's a porky. The Sabbath has always been from its institution, work six, rest one. That's the way it was in Genesis. That was clearly outlined in Exodus 16 before the Torah. There is nothing Nothing, 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 nothing about the Sabbath ever be ever being a rotating day. That was not the work six rest one. That and, no, is, and nobody's schedule could keep up with that. And no. that why would God do that? He uh, yeah, it'd be crazy. That'd yeah. be confusion. And God didn't do that. Yeah, that's right. There's not one shred of scripture to back that up. But, but where yet, did that where did that lunar observance come from? Was that could that be uh from Babylon? <laughs> Oh, when, they were, when they were held uh, captive in Babylon all those years? Yeah. And today, bless their heart, there are people, uh, boy, and I could drop names, that promote the Sabbath like it'd be Wednesday. Uh, then it'd be the next week. Well, it might be Thursday or next month. It changes every month. It'll wow. be on different days. And they got their calendars, and they'll sell you one for 1995. And it's confusion. It's confusion. And the the Sabbath is simple, pure, and beautiful. Work six, rest one. And it doesn't change. That cycle, there's nothing in the Word of God to say that that cycle ever changed. It was still reiterated in Exodus 16 before the Torah. Work six, rest one. Simple as— I got a feeling that uh, Adam, his sons, his grandsons, his great-grandsons, you know, Enoch and Noah, I got a feeling they all— kept a uh, the same schedule yeah and you know here's the implication that here these ignorant hebrews are they were living a nomadic life that they had to depend on the moon to observe the sabbath well i remember roy rogers and his horse trigger you know and roy would say trigger count to three trigger would take his little hoof and go pop 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 even Trigger could count to seven, like these people can't count. We'll work six and rest one. This is ridiculous. God's biblical Sabbath is work six, rest one. And the idea that, wow, they couldn't observe the Sabbath unless they did it to the moon, this is absolute nonsense. Well, and he even made it so simple. He he didn't name any day of the week except by number except for the Sabbath. The first day, the second day, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth the Sabbath, and then do it all over again on the first day, second day, third day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the truth is in the simplicity. Yeah. And well, that's whenever- just too simple. Yeah. You, you see, know, with, with so- our whole culture today stemming from Greek philosophy and all these things, things just can't be that simple. We, ha- we have to, it's got to be more complicated than that. We got to think about this. I mean, that's what I try to do all the time. I'm trying to overthink all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and you see, the Bible, the problem isn't with understanding it. The problem is just with crucifying our will to obey it. (laughs) 
you yeah. know, Obedience. that's what the problem is. And whenever you see somebody, they try to show off how smart they are. And they'll, oh, they're big, elaborate calendar explanations or this and that. And they are just out to draw disciples after themselves. Yeah. The word of God is clear. Work six, rest one. You're good to go. Um, let's go back to Genesis chapter one and let's begin and let's look at the first day. Genesis chapter one, verse three. This is the first day of creation. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, this is the first statement made. <laughs> now, I'm going to make another deep theological statement here, Jim, so buckle up. But when the on the first day of creation, when God said, let there be light, I bet this was the, begin, the beginning of the first day. I imagine God, so. You know, God said, let there be light, and uh, there was light. Now, that's really not too deep. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, this last little part of verse 5, this is the verse that they want to take as an absolute proof text that the day begins at evening. And I know in our conversation this week, you brought this up, that the evening in Genesis 1-5 cannot be the evening of the second day because it had not begun yet. That's We're right. talking about the evening of day one. He worked and then there was the evening and then there was a the morning. Then it was, you know, the end of the day. It's, it's plain as day. It's plain as day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. See what there. I did there? Hey, that was very punny. I tell you, we can be deep and clever. Well, let, let's take a deep, theological look at it, something, and it confirms it, but let's look the word evening up, and in the Strong's, the root word, the root word of evening is 6150, and it means to go, to grow dusky at sundown. Now, let's get deep again here, and let's just think about this. Now, for evening to be, the sun has to go down. Therefore, you can't have evening before you have light. So light has to precede evening. Very simple, very straightforward. Yeah. I tell you what. Now, let's get even deeper. Let's go to. I'm getting a headache. Is, I know it. But this is the theological dictionary of the Old Testament. And this is the top of the food chain for the study of Hebrew words, which I believe in studying the Greek and the Hebrew words God gave. I'm all about it. Yeah. But, and this is just what it means. And he goes, this is so detailed and it goes in to the way that other languages took the Hebrew word for evening and they had their words for it also. And in the Egyptian, it says evening comes with the departure of the sun God. When the sun goes down, that's evening in the Egyptian. Uh, in the Akkadian, it says uh, evening is predicated of the sun. It is entering its dwelling place. It sets and evening begins. Sun sets, evening begins. You got to have sun before you have evening. In the Hebrew, two right nouns derive, marab and ra, arb, 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 setting place of the sun. That's literal. the setting place of the sun. You have to have the sun setting to have evening. So to say the day begins at evening and the first day of creation began at evening instead of morning, just stop. I mean, just stop. You're just catering to rabbinic teaching. And anyone that's doing that Friday night Sabbath, you need to repent and get the leaven out of your life. And follow the simplicity of Christ. Yeah, but there's there's a couple times in Scripture where it talks about starting your Sabbath in the evening. I'm I'm sure you're going to bring that up, though, right? Well, not really, and it, it gets into that in a couple of the feast days. It's and th well, that's my point. It's two feast days, yeah. and it says started on the evening before this day and the evening of that, and and it mentions that twice. Mm -hmm. Now, if that was common practice, why would it have to mention it? Because exactly. it wasn't common practice. On these two feasts, I want you to start the evening before. And, so, those, and that's all that needs to be said about that, sure, really. Yeah. I mean, it's that simple. 
of it's they were the exception to the rule, not the rule. Yeah. And in the case of the Sabbath, they were there and they put the blood on the doorpost and they stayed in because the death angel was coming. Right. Yeah, because Passover was one of those two. Blood doorposts. That's so you know, um, and you know, I love if somebody and I understand that um the Sabbath issue. That's what we want to do today. Make it simple, straightforward, and easy, clear. And it is really clear. And what muddles it is all the different things said about it. Yeah. But I love people that are trying to honor the Sabbath. Yeah. Even if they're doing on a Friday night, they just don't understand when they understand it's rabbinic. They just need to repent and get the leaven out the same way with people in the Sunday Sabbath position. That's wrong. I'm convinced it's wrong. But I love people, and I know there have been some really men of God I admire that believe the Sunday Sabbath position. Yeah. And I think today, people that go to church on Sunday, they don't have any conception that they're honoring the Sabbath. That They're just doing whatever they do on Sunday. They're not thinking of even trying to honor Sunday as the Sabbath anymore. I don't believe Yeah, it. they're just going to church. I mean, if you if you think that Sunday is the Sabbath, are you treating it with the reverence that the Word of God requires? Or are you just going to church, and then are you going and spending money and making other people work, you know, at restaurants afterwards, and and all those things, or do you or do you go right back home, rest, spend more time with God, with your family, you know, and separate yourself from the world? When I was a Sunday Sabbath person, I I went to church and then I went and did whatever I wanted the rest of the day. Most yeah. of the time, I went back to work. Yeah, you know, so. The whole thing is is uh, just it's a lot more simple than than uh, like you say. It's just it's not difficult. No, and and it's my favorite. I work each every day just counting down the days to Sabbath. It's my favorite day, and and it it's like a separation from the world. I I don't go out or anything really right now. I'm not in a community area where there's a lot of people to have a community with, but. Um, yeah, I just I love it. It's so it's like it's so when good. I make Sabbath, it's like, whew, oh yeah, <laughs> thank God. But I, I tell you what, I believe anyone that will begin honoring, remembering the Sabbath day, that it will be such a blessing to you. You'll understand. Well, this is a blessed day. Well, it's like that that other episode we did on this. It was called a perpetual sign. Yeah. It's a perpetual sign between God and us. That's what he yeah. said. I didn't say that. He said that. Yeah. So it's pretty special to God. Yeah. And when we observe the Sabbath, this is the sign of the people of God. Not just the Israel of God. This was the sign of the people of God before the there was an Israel of God. Yeah. See, work six, rest one. That's always been the sign of God's people. Yeah. And uh, and in the end time, the remnant that overcomes the B system, they are those that will have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. You're not going to overcome by throwing the commandments of God in the trash can. Jesus said those. The, I just read that in Revelation. Jesus said that those that keep the commandments will be the ones who, who can enter into the gates. Yeah, yeah. And the deep theological meaning of that is it means just what it says. It's just like Charles Spurgeon in that time somebody wrote a letter about a scripture, and he says, uh, what does this scripture mean? And he wrote back and he says, dear brother, that scripture means just what it says. Yours truly, Charles Spurgeon. And when it says only those that keep the commandments will enter into the gates, that means just what it says. Now, that is disturbing when you think about uh, an American evangelical church gone wild that has thrown God's uh, commandments in the trash can, but they're not 10 suggestions. Well, they're not 10 suggestions. David, you got to understand people, I know you do, but I mean, people have to understand that. Pretty much every Protestant church that exists today, denomination, all came out of the Catholic Church, which perpetuated this Sunday Sabbath lie 
to to a to a, a, a worldwide degree more than anybody even before them. Yeah. So all these churches come out of that, and they just kept doing that. Yeah, it's all we've ever known. Yeah, and the um, for centuries, the modern, and there is really no Protestant churches anymore. Very few that are protesting anything. They're falling well, that's in line with <laughs> Rome. You know, they're they're more than uh, if you criticize Rome. You know, you're liable to get the Protestants, so-called Protestants, mad anymore. Yeah. But um, another thing I say over and over about Scripture, you know, you you can know what a word means. You can look it up in an English dictionary. You can look it up in a theological dictionary. But the Bible is its own built-in dictionary. And let's have the Bible defend the define the word evening, Deuteronomy 16.6. And it says here, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, comma, at the going down of the sun. There we see evening in the word of God defined as at the going down of the sun. There you go. Exodus 35 and three Exodus chapter 35 and verse three and the text here. I don't want to talk about something. Uh, the Sabbath existed from the seventh day of creation. It was observed by God's people all the way down to Moses. And then Moses, when Israel was taken into the land, there were more regulations given by the father for when Israel was in the land. Now, Israel is no longer in the land. And I always say that we should apply every law of God to ourselves that we can apply. Sure. But some just do not apply. The Levitical system, thank God, has been done away. The animal sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood that's presided over it has been replaced by Christ, the Lamb of God. That's the whole the book Bible. of Hebrews. Yeah. Now this, <laughs> right, that shouldn't be controversial either, but mm. oh my goodness, the people yeah. in the Hebrew root movement that want to argue for their perpetuity in the Levitical priesthood. It's just rank heresy, and it's blasphemy uh, against that which Christ We have did. one high priest, Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. Now, we need to think about this, and a lot of times in regard to the feasts, Israel is no longer in the land, and if we would try to observe Sabbath or Pentecost or tabernacles according to the letter of the law when Israel was in the land, we would have to go to Israel. The three great feasts, they were required to come to Israel while they were in the land. We're not in the land, and thank God, God is not going to hold it against us if we can't all go to Israel. That's impossible for most of us. Well, we couldn't even go now unless we had could proof that we've taken a procedure of some sort or another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take the jab and mm. celebrate the feast. Yeah, yeah, and I tell you, one of the craziest nations on earth about the jab is Israel. That's right. They're doing, they're leading the way on beast technology and people that really understand about what's going on there, that wouldn't be surprising to them. Right. But the point we need to think about, let, let's read Exodus uh, chapter 35 and verse 3. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Now, when Israel was in the land, that was fine. They had a climate where that would work. Even in the wintertime? They're, aren't they on the same kind of climate we are? I think they're a little warmer. I don't know. I'm not sure. But And it gets cold over there. But That, that was my question. Like, well, what did they do on the Sabbath? It had to get cold in the winter a little bit. Yeah. But it usually I don't think it's like kill you cold. Right. Like, like it would be. Uh, you could fix it to where you could get by, but... Like if you lived in Alaska yeah, you know, or up in Canada where, you know, you could die if you didn't have a fire on the Sabbath day. We just need to have a little sense and understand that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And you can't. And this is what the Pharisees did. 
they would want to have a super pharisaical interpretation of the Sabbath. And uh, this is what Christ came against. So just a little common sense, please. And uh, no more than we can take the details of the feast and say, well, you can't have a real Passover unless you go to Israel. You cannot take the things when Israel was in the land and apply them literally, though they are good guides. They do give us an understanding of the uh, the spirit of the Sabbath that we need to, to understand. Well, on those days, I mean, I, I still meditate on those days and I re- recall what why they were to do it and what it represented for them. And it still represents those things today. And we have to understand that these things were the shadows and Christ is the reality. Right. Uh, In Mark chapter two, verse 27. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. I want to read Albert Barnes note on that. It's very good. He said, the Sabbath was made for man for his rest from toil, his rest from the cares and anxieties of the world to give him an opportunity to call off his attention from earthly concerns and to direct it to the affairs of eternity. It was a kind provision for man that he might refresh his body by relaxing his labors that he might have undisturbed time to seek the consolations of religion, to cheer him in the anxieties and sorrows of a troubled world, and that he might render to God that homage which is most justly due to him as the creator, preserver, benefactor, and redeemer of the world. The Sabbath is a tremendous blessing. Yeah, it is. And if you begin to obey the Sabbath and remember it, You'll never get anybody to make you stop because it's such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful blessing. Um, In Mark chapter three, let's look at Mark chapter three and let's look at verses one through five. And the text says here, and he entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And on the Sabbath, Jesus was in the synagogue observing the Sabbath. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, and he saith unto them, is it lawful to good, do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, Jesus got mad at these guys because they were trying to pharisize the Sabbath and take it away from its original intention. Mm -hmm. Jesus got mad. Jesus got mad. Good for you, Jesus. We ought to get mad when we see people trying to pervert the Sabbath. I tell you, man, on this, as I've been studying this, there's been several times that I've felt angry just because I would read stuff and See, people call it the Lord's Day, or they would call it the Christian Sabbath, and I know what they mean when they say that. And I, I would just feel myself getting angry. <laughs> I'm like trying to calm down a little bit. Yeah, and I'll read the comment. Uh, from did did Paul- you finish that? Oh. Did I interrupt you too much? Well, on I that? just I might have not read. Let's read the rest of half of verse five. I'll read all of verse five again. Okay. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being greed for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. And look at verse six. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Think about that. I mean, Herod was not even a a godly man on any level, and I've done some studying on the Herodians and the Pharisees, and that that verse right there just shows you where they were at. Yeah. There was nothing about God in that at all. Yeah, and the Herodians were Edomites, and there's a lot, lot, lot to that Is that Ishmael? Yeah, from Esau. Esau, yeah. From Esau, the Edomites, and boy, that's a... 
another whole lesson right there. Yep. Now, the pulpit commentary has a very good comment. It says, if anyone having it in his power admits to do an act of mercy on the Sabbath day for one grievously afflict, afflicted as this man is, if he is able to cure him as I, Christ, am able, he does him a wrong. Now, think about this. And there was a guy. I've got his book. And he was a teacher at the University of Jerusalem, a strict Jewish school. And this fellow one day was, uh, I, I can't call his name, but uh, anyway, I've read his book. It's great. And there was an automobile accident. And the person was hurt bad. It was on the Sabbath. And he runs over to check on him and there's the person in the car is bloody and injured. There's a guy on the street. He runs over, let me, and this was back when not everybody had a cell phone, but they were just coming out and he went over. The guy had a cell phone. He said, let me call an ambulance for this person. And the person said, no, this person's a Gentile. And this is the Sabbath that would be against God's law. And this fellow went on to be very outspoken against the hypocrisy of the Talmud and of uh, rabbinic Judaism and how racist it was. Now, mm. if that man, while saying he was honoring the Sabbath, violated the Sabbath because he refused to do good on the Sabbath day. Um, I'll read a little more of this comment. It says, if anyone having it in his power omits to do an act of mercy on the Sabbath day for one grievously afflicted as this man is, if he is able to cure him as I Christ am able, he does him a wrong for he denies him that help, which he owes him by the law of charity. Our Lord thus plainly signifies that not to do an act of kindness to a sick man on the Sabbath day when you're able to do it is really to do him a wrong. Well, Jesus even said, if your ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, you're going to pull it out, and that's fine. Yeah. How much more important is a, is a human a human being? And it's just that spirit of Phariseeism yeah. that raises its head so much. And, and I'll say this, for someone, and, you know, if these situations arise on the Sabbath, I'll do it. But I'll also say that I will not use the Sabbath when I'm, okay, I got all the stuff I got to do this week. I need to do something for this person. Well, I'll put that off to the Sabbath, and I'll do it on the Sabbath. Uh-uh. Don't do that. It's only if, it, if it's a last resort. That's exactly right. I tell you, on the Sabbath, I shut off my phone. I get with the Lord, and it better be good if you interrupt me. Cause now— I did I did perform that wedding a couple Sabbaths ago, but I felt like that was a good thing to do because uniting a man and woman in a covenant relationship before God, you know, was a good thing to do. Yeah, and Jesus cast out devils and ministered on the Sabbath. Yeah. And uh, we will do likewise sometimes. Yep. Uh, and we will uh, do that midnight ride on the Sabbath. I think that's a good thing. Though so some people might disagree. I think that's a real good thing. Um, Isaiah chapter 58. I love these scriptures. Isaiah chapter 58, 13 and 14. This catches the spirit of the Sabbath so perfectly. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. All right, break that one down a little bit for us, because it, it really reads like, and I, I know I've heard a lot of people talk about this, like, well, does that mean we can't do, even if, even if we are home and we're not doing anything, does that mean that we can't uh, 
do anything that would typically be something we enjoy doing? No, no, it doesn't rest. Um, Cause it says don't do your own pleasure. I guess that's, that's what throws people off or raises yeah, a question. It, it's talking about, um, pleasuring yourself in a way that would be a carnal in a worldly way. That is not something. And of course to, to rest, uh, a lot of things are restful to people that is enjoyable. And, uh, there's a line there. And of course I can't be, uh, the, the Holy spirit has to lead people on yeah. how to do it. A lot of people will want me to pass judgment on every little thing. And that ain't my job. That's Holy spirit's job. Right. What the Bible says is to call the Sabbath a delight. I know one friend of mine enjoys hiking and they'll hike on the Sabbath and go out in the woods. And, and they read. probably talk to God while they're out there. I think that's great. I think that's a great way to spend the Sabbath. And that's, Jesus always up going up in the mountain. and, and Yeah. And of know. course, that's something the person enjoys doing, but it's something that's restful and helps to get your mind set apart for the Lord. So we just need to let the Holy Spirit lead us and not be a Pharisee. Right. And that call the Sabbath a delight and delight in the Lord's ways on the Sabbath. And, uh, that's it. Don't work. Just do his ways and not yours. And, uh, it's not hard. It's not hard. And the Lord will, uh, help you to sort it out in, uh, Mark chapter two and verse 28. Therefore, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath, which means, and I'll read a good comment here from Heinrich Meyer. And he said this concerning this verse, uh, he said that according to David's precedent, the proceeding, uh, the proceeding of the disciples as enjoined by necessity is by no means unallowable. Now, this was the argument Christ made of David eating the showbread on the Sabbath when he was in flight for his life. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, a little common sense, please. And Jesus was differing with the Pharisees and their interpretation of the Sabbath. And Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, so I bet he's right, not them. And he goes on to say, Brother Meyer says, that the Sabbath makes no difference in the matter. And what Jesus did was not a violation of the Sabbath. Jesus did not violate the Sabbath at any time. He kept it. He kept it perfectly. And he showed us the true meaning of the Sabbath and the true spirit with which we should observe it. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, the Messiah has to rule even over the Sabbath. So thus the disciples who as my disciples have acted under my permission cannot be affected by any reproach in respect to the Sabbath. And, you know, and just basically, you know, the, to the Pharisees, you know, they're doing what I told them was okay to do. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So don't be talking smack to them, you know, and it's the same thing where the Pharisees want to come in and, uh, you know, you know, just getting everyone's stuff over a little minutia that goes away from the spirit of what the true Sabbath really means. A well, blessing. They, did, they didn't believe Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath anyway. They didn't believe he was the son of God. He wasn't the Messiah. I mean, how many times did Jesus say if if somebody comes in their name, you'll believe them. But if I come in my father's name, you don't believe me. Or he'll say, you know, uh, there's just so many scriptures where he talks about and just their unbelief, you know, yep. into who he was. Yeah. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And here's the thing. When we have people, you know, and so many questions on when is the Sabbath? How do I observe the Sabbath? And when we take Christ as our absolute authority and example, it's easy and it's clear. Yeah. It's just a matter of whether you want to follow Christ or not. That's the only answer. Uh, it's not about would be in trouble if we had to be real smart to understand it. It's very, very simple. Um, and let's just cloud the issue with a few more facts. Luke's Luke 23. Uh, let's begin reading in verse 52. 
And the scripture says, this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And here's another point. Jesus was crucified about three in the afternoon. And by the time that they went to get you mean permission. He, you mean he died at about three in the afternoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he passed away about, thank you. Yeah, yep. he passed away about three in the afternoon. And then they had to go get permission to get the body, go back, take the body, and prepare it. And if you study the preparation of all that was done to prepare the body, a lot. This yeah. took way up into the night. The point being, this went way beyond sundown. Went way beyond sundown. Now, it goes on to say, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone where never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. That means the Sabbath was drawing near. When the sun would come up, it would be the Sabbath. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how the body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now, here's another big news flash here for everybody. The people that knew Jesus personally while he was on the earth, they honored the Sabbath and they honored the sunrise Sabbath. Now, if these people and these people knew Jesus yeah. and some of his closest friends and followers, and if Jesus had said, as many theologians today would assume him to say, now, when I die, the Old Testament, Ten Commandments are gone. The Sabbath will change from Saturday to Sunday. There wasn't none of that. You know, they kept right on observing the Sabbath, the people that were the closest to him. There's not a thing in the Bible about the Sabbath ever being done away with, the Sabbath ever being changed to Sunday. I can't find it. Nothing. Just like there's nothing in the Bible to say that the Sabbath begins on Friday night. You know, we're supposed to teach what the Bible says, not what the Bible doesn't say. Let everything be established in the mouth of two and three script, two and three witnesses. When you have no scriptures for a Friday night Sabbath, you shouldn't do it. And you, you can't take a, a half of a verse and try to read something into it and twist it. When there's no scripture to say the Sabbath would change, you probably shouldn't teach that either. You probably would do good remembering the Sabbath day as it was in the beginning and doing that. If it's got any uh, slight hint of rabbinical Judaism, I I have to think long and hard and, and do a lot of research before I even, I mean, because in the beginning I used to, I, I, I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds great. Cause some of it sounds awesome. Yeah. Let's, let's light candles and let's do this and that. that that's vibey. That's cool and fun. You know, let's do this on this certain day. And you start really realizing that's just a, a ritual, a, tra a man-made tradition no basis in the Bible. And there's a lot of things in Judaism that are good. Yeah. There are things in Catholicism that are good. There's things in Mormonism that are good. But let's just say we have a Catholic friend that for Lent, they're going to give up whiskey. Or anything for an example. Now that is a good thing to give up whiskey for Lent, but that doesn't mean that we, and I actually heard somebody uh, on Christian radio, he was lifting up the Puritans and then he went on to talk about what he was going to give up for Lent. And I thought, you know, eh, 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 eh. but you so you're see, saying the Puritans didn't uh, do Lent? No, they thought Lent was that stuff in your dryer. You know, <laughs> they had dryers back then. Well, yeah, yeah, it was probably over the clothesline, but they had them. <laughs> but you see, the point is, 
just because there can be good things associated with Lent, we don't adopt Lent to have people draw closer to God. We have the word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the cross. And let's take uh, the 10 days of awe during the fall feast, where you take 10 days to repent. Now, repenting for 10 days is a good thing, but we should be repentant all of the time. And the word of God it's is a lifestyle. Our you don't take the things of rabbinic Judaism or Catholicism or Mormonism or any other ism to add to the scripture. It's Bible, Bible only, 100%. And as you said, every hint of rabbinic Judaism should be put from her life without, without any equivocation. If it's not in the word of God, we don't do it. That's it. No discussion. Um, in the apostolic constitutions, this came about uh, just right before Constantine, early fourth century. And this gives us a good picture of the observance. The Sunday Sabbath teaching came in early. Uh, I can see it in Ignatius, early second century. Yeah. And he was an influential figure. And the reason why that developed is the Jews were murdering Christians. Yep. And when the Jews were murdering Christians, that turned a lot of people sour. And uh, they thought that, man, we can't worship on a day they're worshiping. It must be Sunday. And that was wrong, but I understand why they did it. But that was not the predominant position. Uh, in this writing of the Apostolic Constitutions, this is in the uh, Antonicene Fathers, Volume 7. It's on page 469, and it says, But keep the Sabbath and the Lord's Day festival. And the Lord's Day was Sunday, which you can see in Scripture and history. They worshipped on Sunday, but the early believers, in the most part, that worshipped on Sunday— did not do away with the Sabbath. And like here, all the way up, early 4th century, right before Constantine, it says, but keep the Sabbath and the Lord's Day festival because the former is the memorial of the creation and the latter of the resurrection. So there was certainly historical precedent for honoring the Sabbath. And also a lot of people will say, well, boy, it's wrong to ever worship or have a meeting on Sunday. That's the Sunday. Well, the early church did it. They did it in scripture. Well, I no, read today, I read today in Acts where all the apostles got together daily, like yep. every day of the week. Yeah. And, and, and there's this, I read a scripture where Jesus was saying, right after they, they captured him in, in the garden, he says, why are you here with all these? Didn't I sit amongst you daily teaching? Yeah. Even Jesus was teaching daily, but yeah. the Sabbath was the Sabbath. Yeah. And what becomes problematic in my mind is not that a person, we will have meetings on Sunday sometimes, but when a person says that Saturday is no longer the Sabbath, so therefore we'll worship on Sunday. Right. That's when it becomes problematic. That's, the problem. That's when believed the father might have a problem with you. Now let's cloud the issue with some more facts. Luke's chapter four, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up as his custom was. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And we're going to look at the rest of this text in a moment. Jesus began his ministry on the Sabbath. It began on the Sabbath. And in Luke chapter 23, and verse 54, his ministry ended right before the Sabbath, and then he rested. Let's read that text. Mm. And that day was the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew on. We just read that text a minute ago. And uh, his ministry ended right before the Sabbath, and his whole ministry <coughs> was like a Sabbath ministry. Now, the last act. He resurrected, he resurrected on a Sabbath. The last, yeah, at it, as the beginning of the Sunday morning. Yeah. There you go. He, he had already the, resurrected because she came as, as the Sabbath, as the first day of the, of the week drew on or approached or whatever Matthew 28 said, it, 
He had already risen. She she got there and he's gone. Yeah. Yeah. He was already out of there. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. He rose on the Sabbath and he was already gone. Sabbath yeah. was pretty uh, important in, yeah, his, it's, it's, in, in and, his whole <laughs> written time here. It's all the time. It's it's Sabbath, and and the way he was he was doing all this healing on the Sabbath. I'm sure he did healings on other days of the week, but he made it. It's almost like he made a point of doing it on the Sabbath, you know, just to show the Pharisees. Yeah, he made a big deal about it, and this is why they wanted to kill him. We saw that in the third chapter, Mark, the 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 healing of the man there with the withered hand in Luke 13. This is the last thing that Christ ever did on the Sabbath in the synagogue. It says, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto the woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Ought not this, ought and ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done in him. And this was the last recorded act that Christ did in the synagogue. He walked away from them after this. And this was a repeated thing, as we've seen. Uh, he does good, heals on the Sabbath. Ah! Well, there you go. You know, the the temple, the judgment uh, on the whole thing was going to come from the Lord of, of the Sabbath yep. and the creator of all things. Um, let's look at Exodus chapter 23 and verse 12. And uh, this is another beautiful text. And this text just shows how that in that which Christ was doing, that he was getting back to that original intent of the Sabbath. It says, six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest. Work six, rest one. That thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. It was to be a blessing for everyone, uh, for the people that uh, would work, the stranger, the handmaidens. It was a day of kindness and refreshing to people, you know, and this is what Christ wanted to bring back. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get that, uh, we're going to get something uh, very, very, very precious. You know, um, and it's just like the enemy. Sabbath now is one of the busiest days for people because that's a day off from their regular job. Now they got to rush around and get all their shopping done and this done and that, mow the yard, go fix that, take the car, work on. You know, it's just, that's my day off, you know? I mean, it's just like the enemy. It's not restful at all. No. <laughs> um, let's look at another thing that is twisted so badly. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he saith, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And jumping down to verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he hath also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And what a beautiful text that tells us that Christ is our Sabbath and that we rest in him. Now, here's what the devil will do. He'll say, you got to pick. You got to either believe 
that Christ is our Sabbath rest. And if you believe that, that means there's not a Sabbath day. Or if you believe there's a Sabbath day, that means that Christ is not really our Sabbath and we rest in him. And you see, that's just demonic word salad. There is a Sabbath and Christ is our Sabbath rest. Both are true. I've heard people even explain that, David, like, no, this 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 chapter's talking about uh he's your rest from works. Like your work you can't work to be saved. The, he takes that work from you. That's so they explain it that way. And then one other way I, I've I've heard people explain this is that this is talking about after we die. Yeah. And it is very true that we cease from all efforts to try to save ourselves or sanctify ourselves. We rest in the finished work of the cross, but this does not negate the Sabbath. Now, I want to have a little help here from John Owen. John Owen, one of our Puritan buddies, who we hear from regularly, this is what he said in his commentary on Hebrews. He said, and the reason is because by that word, Sabbatism, he intended to express the rest of the gospel, not absolutely, but with respect unto the pledge of it in the day of rest, which is given and determined unto them that believe, you see. So this rest, it's in the gospel, but it's in reference to the Sabbath. You see, it's not one or the other. It's the rest as it relates to the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath is a picture of the future rest in Christ, but it doesn't negate the Sabbath. He goes on to say, uh, with respect unto the pledge of it in the day of rest, which is given and determined unto them that believe for the worship of God and other ends before recounted. But the apostle here returns to exhort the Hebrews to endeavor after an interest in and participation of the whole rest of God in the gospel with all the privileges and advantages contained in it, and therefore resumes the word whereby he had ex before expressed the rest of God in general. And he goes on to say, let us diligently study, endeavor, or labor to this purpose. And that's what we're doing to, to this evening. We're laboring to diligently study to understand not only the meaning of the first Sabbath and of the importance of us remembering the Sabbath day, but of the even bigger picture of it all being a type of Christ who is our Sabbath rest. And Christ as our Sabbath and as our Sabbath rest does not do away with the law, but it fulfills it. And it helps us to understand it's deeper and our, it is pure meaning. So these are such beautiful truths. And blessed are those that can get a hold of them. Because I tell you, the blessings are truly uh, phenomenal. And I know that uh, our, our listeners, they're going to get it. And uh, they're going to get it. And they're going to be blessed by it. Amen. Uh, let's look. A couple more things here I want to look at. Uh, let's go to Colossians. And uh, let's go to Colossians chapter 2. And this is one of the classic texts that's used against people that want to honor the Sabbath on Colossians chapter two. And let's read verse 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, let's just read verse 22 while we're in the neighborhood here. It says, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So what Paul was rebuking here was not the commandments and doctrines of God, but that of men. What men were trying to add to the observance 
of the Sabbath. Mm. Now, there's a very good comment here from a book. It's called To Sunday from Sabbath by one of my Italian brothers, uh, Samuel Bacciocci. Oh, Bacciocci. Bacciocci. Sounds like a new dance, doesn't it? Um, But on page 343, he has a real good, he nails it. And we've talked about this before, but when I find somebody else agrees with me, I get excited. And uh, he says this on page 343, and he talks about the Colossian heresy. And uh, as we have before, I, I think we have on DOCs, but he describes it as Gnostic Judaism. And all of the Gnostic schools were started by Hebrews. And this was intentional to try to destroy the true biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. I have to remind people that the Jews did not receive Jesus Christ, and they saw the early Christians as their enemies, and there was a tremendous period of, of bloodshed and persecution. And Gnosticism was one of the tools that and I could read again in the Jewish encyclopedia where they claim and proudly boast every one of the Gnostic schools were started by by Jews. And he goes on to say by Hellenistic syncretism and Hellenistic means that of the Greek culture and the Greek culture wanted to syncretize religion and just basically have a smorgasbord grabbing from here and there and bring it in. That's what people today want to do. Well, this is in Judaism. That sounds good. You know, we'll do the 10 days of all Lent. Okay, that's good. You see, they want to just pull things in instead of sticking with the word of God and the word of God only. Now, he goes on to say, uh, he says, on the basis of this bare outline, We can already establish that the Sabbath is mentioned in the passage, not in the context of a direct discussion on the obligation of the law, but rather in the context of synchreistic beliefs and practices, which incorporated elements from the Old Testament undoubtedly to provide to provide a justification for their ascetic principles. So, in other words, it's not about whether we should do the Sabbath or not, but it's about all the stuff people are wanting to tack on to it. That's the point. I'm glad you did, in other words. Yeah. (laughs) I needed that. By the Colossian philosophers, we are not informed what type of Sabbath observance these teachers promoted. Nevertheless, on the basis of their emphasis on scrupulous adherence to regulations, it is apparent that the day was to be observed in a most rigorous manner and superstitious manner. It is possible, in fact, that we, sh- as we shall discuss later, that astrological beliefs attached to the day of Saturn made the observance of the day all the more superstitious. It is then, if then, as is generally recognized, Paul in Colossians is refuting not the usual brand of Jewish or Christian religious legalism, but rather a synchreistic philosophy which was incorporated among other among other Jewish elements. So he's exactly right. Paul is dealing with the craziness, and if we're not to let other, see, we're not to let other people observe us in the way the Holy Spirit leads us to observe the Sabbath. And this is the whole point of the scripture, not to do away with the Sabbath. Now, one more thing. Uh, Let's go back to Luke chapter four. And uh, I want to read this text again. Luke chapter four, and let's read a little farther this time. Uh, we read verse 16 earlier. Let's start. Let's just start with verse 16 and let's read a little. Uh, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath the anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I want to read a statement here from 
a book called The Dictionary of Christ and the Gospels. It's a big book. And there's a statement here. I think we've read this before on an episode, if I remember correctly. But he says here, Yoder claimed that Jesus' agenda was shaped by his resolve to implement the Jubilee year, and that Luke in particular highlighted this interpretation. Jesus' reading from Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, in Luke 4, 18 and 19, in the synagogue at Galilee, marked the inception of the Jubilee year as the year of the Lord's favor. Yoder saw Jesus teaching about forgiveness, especially the petition about forgiving debts in the Lord's Prayer as implementation of the ordinance of Leviticus 25. And here again, we see the Mm. true fulfillment and understanding of the Jubilee year. Now, let's look at Isaiah 61. And the Jubilee year run in cycles of seven. And in Isaiah 61, this is the passage Jesus was quoting from in the passage we just read in Luke 4. And it's very interesting to note where he stopped reading. (laughs) In Isaiah 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable gear of the Lord, comma, and that's where he stopped in Luke. But then it goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. See, it's not time for that yet. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. The Jubilee run in cycles of seven, seven years, seven sevens. 49, the 50th year, Jubilee. Jesus said, this is the Jubilee. And when the year of the Lord's favor. Now, there were three and a half years of Christ's ministry upon the earth. And in the book of Revelation, we see a time period, 1,260 days, 42 months, a time, time, and a half time. All of these are three and a half years. So you see, We got three and a half years here when Christ was on the earth, three and a half years to there. That's seven years. You see, this is a Jubilee cycle. Now, let's look at this uh, in Daniel 927. And in the book of Daniel, chapter nine, verse 27. And bless their hearts, our dispensational friends, they get this a little confused. They think the covenant is with the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. Whoops, you know, doggone it. Just a little, just a little off there. But in Daniel 9, 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and, sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, historically, and I'm going to give a couple examples from pre-dispensational teachers, one from Matthew Henry and one from Matthew Poole. And the belief was that the covenant was with Jesus Christ. Wait There's a minute. No, this, this covenant's not with the Antichrist? No. There's, no. there's only one covenant that is a godly covenant in Scripture uh, that is a in Isaiah 28, it talks about the covenant with death and hell. God is the covenant God that makes covenants with his people, mm. not the devil. <laughs> you know, and whoops, you know, it's the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. Well, this is something that was not taught until the rise of dispensationalism. Wow. And you're blowing my mind right now, David. Yeah. And I have, I, I don't realize, um, what a good job dispensationalists have done by bombarding people with these teachings and the scenarios, you know, Oh, we got seven year tribulation. We got the rebuilt temple and in the middle of it, he's going to go into the temple and the rebuilt temple and all this. It's all dispensationalist sky castle. Now I'll read a couple interpretations before dispensationalism, which arose 
in the 1830s, and then this teaching began to develop. We'll go to Matthew Poole, who was a Puritan expositor. And under Daniel 927, Matthew Poole says this, I say then with Gracer, Mead, and others that this he is the Messiah, and the covenant he confirms is the New Testament or covenant called, therefore, the covenant of the people. This was the teaching of the Puritans, the teaching of John Wesley and his followers, the teaching of pretty much ever Bible believer until dispensationalism, that the covenant is with Jesus Christ, but now, nah, whoops, it's the Antichrist. I mean, this is just one of the many twists that dispensationalism puts on the word of God. And of course, when you flip Daniel 9 as being a covenant with the devil instead of God, you get a totally different outlook, obviously. D- David, I was talking to a friend last week about this. And we were talking about how, yeah, the Antichrist, he's got a three and a half, he's got a seven year covenant. I mean, we were just having this completely dispensational conversation. I have, I've never heard this. Well, I'm so thankful that um, we're able to talk about this and yeah. yeah, and it is just so, um, frustrating that they're able to do such a good job in sowing confusion in so many places. And this is a huge one. Um, Matthew Henry, we'll read one more. It says, Matthew Henry's comment on this, he shall confirm the covenant with many. He shall introduce a new covenant between God and man, a covenant of grace, since it had been impossible for us to be saved by a covenant of innocence. This covenant he shall confirm by his doctrine and miracles, by his death and resurrection. And it goes on in this text to say that in the middle of the week, half of seven is three and a half, he died on the cross, the sacrifice and the oblation was made obsolete. And every animal sacrifice after that was an abomination. He goes on to say, Matthew Henry, by offering himself a sacrifice once for all, he shall put an end to all the Levitical sacrifices, shall supersede them and set them aside. When the substance comes, the shadow shall be done away. And when you read Daniel 9, 27 like that, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And that which I shared with you is the faith of the Puritans. It's the faith of the the early believers. We don't get a covenant with Antichrist until dispensationalism. And this just totally flips everything. So what's the... What's the back three and a half years of, of that same covenant or well, the 70th week? In this passage in Luke 17, which we're going to read, there are two time periods called the days of the Son of Man. One is when Jesus was on the earth with his disciples. A future one will be during the last half of the confirmation of the covenant, which will take place in the last half of the 70th week of Daniel which is referred to in the book of Revelation, 42 months, 1,260 days at time, time and a half time. There's three and a half years here, three and a half years there. That's seven years. Jubilee, Jubilee. And um, let's read it. Luke 17. uh, Let's begin reading in verse 22. And he said unto the disciples, the days will come when ye desire, when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it, because Jesus was going to die, and they would miss him, and they would long for those days when he was with them in the flesh. Yeah. And they shall say to you, see here, see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. Now there's a 
day of the Son of Man, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord. Yeah, the That's day of the, Lord. the day of his return. But first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation? Now he begins to prophesy, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. He's prophesying of a future event here. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. There was a days of the Son of Man when he was on the earth. There will be a time period called the days of the Son of Man right before his return. He said they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that no entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of light, they, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So in the, the day before the day the Son of Man re is revealed, there will be another time period called the days the Son of Man. You see, this is the two halves of the confirmation of the covenant. He confirmed the covenant for three and a half years while he was on earth. He confirmed the, he will confirm the covenant for three and a half years during the time period in the book of Revelation. Spoken of as 42 months, uh, 1,260 days. You see, this is Daniel 9, 27. In the midst of the week, right in the middle of it. Half of seven, three and a half, you see. In the middle of the week, he died upon the cross. Sacrifice and oblation caused to cease. New covenant with Jesus Christ. Not with the Antichrist, with Jesus Christ. My mind is blown, man. That's the first time I've heard that. Wow. Now, this may seem elemental of a question, uh, but... What's the period between those two and a half or those three and a half years, the two, the end caps? What's, what's that in the middle? That's, I'm assuming that's where we live now yeah. and where we've lived ever since. That's where we live now. Absolutely. And you see, during, um, the time when Christ was on earth, he did miracles. His disciples did miracles. And in the book of Revelation, we see the two witnesses who are able to even call fire down from heaven. And it said they prophesied 1,260 days. You see, we're going to see a return of the miraculous because, you see, Jesus confirmed the covenant with signs following. Mm -hmm. And he will confirm the covenant with signs following during this last half of the 70th week of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a good thing for us. It to is think. good. Very good thing. And just like we read the one quote from this dictionary of Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus was putting, when he said that this is the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of the Lord's favor, that's the Jubilee. He was placing his whole ministry in the context of the Jubilee and the cycle of seven. So in the cycle of seven, three and a half here, three and a half there. He'll confirm the covenant for one week. In the midst of the week, the sacrifice and the oblation will cease. And like Henry said and Poole said, this covenant is the new covenant that done away with the Levitical sacrifices. It has been our great pleasure, as it always is, to bring you the doctrine of Christ and on the issue of the Sabbath, when we understand that Jesus placed his entire ministry in the context of a jubilee, when we understand that the Sabbath was a picture and a type of the rest that we will find in the New Testament, there is just not words that we could use to encourage or express to you the blessings that you will experience when you remember the Sabbath day. But I guarantee you, 
when you begin to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, you will be so blessed that no one will ever be able to stop you. With all of my heart, with all, with all.